Hi, Girish. Hi, <laughs> morning. so, Morning, um, today I will we'll continue our discussion on uh, on the on what I've learned through my journey through Bharatiya Darshanas. Uh, and uh, so, as I mentioned last time, also. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the, describe the darshanas themselves, the astika darshanas, the astika darshanas, etc. Uh, nor will I make a, a critique of them. Okay. So this is not a critical uh, uh, evaluation of those things. It's uh, uh, in this discussion right now. What I want to present is some of the You can call them tidbits, but they are so important in our culture, in our tradition, in our daily life uh, that I, I I was greatly impressed by this. So last time we discussed a couple uh, on um, uh, on the on education. How do we how do we acquire knowledge and so on? Right, the the quarter quarter system, right? Quarter from the twenty five percent from the guru, twenty five percent from uh self contemplation and uh, reflection and 25% with uh, with a discussion with a peer group uh, uh others who are also studying that subject and last 25% with a experience of life kalakramena and we also discussed about the discipline that is required in the writing a shastra so which applies to writing anything for that matter which in, that is which is called anubandha chatushtaya that be clear and state it in the beginning itself of who is your target audience which is called adhikari and what is the subject of your of your writing be clear on that vishaya and don't wander around here and there start with something and end up somewhere else and third is what is the benefit they are going to get from it so that they have to invest their time and energy in studying it Okay, so, and fourth is, of course, relationship among all this. It's called Sambandha. Adhikari Vishaya Prayojana Sambandha. Now, this is, together are called Anubandha Chetashtaya. And as I mentioned last time, that first, in any Shastra, the Shastrakara will, will, uh, uh, will humbly submit that I learned this from the previous generations, my gurus, etc. And my T1 mention is DT. His uh, and everybody has their own DT, and there's no one DT as you know in the Indian tradition. So each one will talk about his DT, and he will talk about the uh, might talk about the uh, guru who gave him the uh, who from whom he learned. Okay, so which is a symbol of humility. Basically, he is not though he might have innovated, though he might have be saying something new also, but he wants to acknowledge that this is not something you know. I'm a great genius, and I, now I'm going to propound. Okay, with that intellectual arrogance. He is saying, I learned from all the previous accumulated knowledge from previous generations. And now, this is the way I look at it and presents his thing. Uh, so, these are the two things we addressed last time. And today, I want to talk about two things. Uh, one is verbal communication, theory of verbal communication. Now, it's not clear whether they meant this is, this is the way Because this, this particular thing has been interpreted in two ways. One is, how is speech produced? Okay, how speech comes out of the body? So, the, the, slow, the, the concepts I'm going to talk about have been interpreted this way also. But it has also been explained to me by the Pandiji that I learned from as which is the most... Uh, best way of verbally communicating something to somebody else. So, if you want the other person to understand what you're saying, and and you know, and and that you should hit the target, right? You you want to convey something to the other person, right? So then then what is the process of that? So if you are aware of that, even though. Things can happen in seconds and sometimes milliseconds. This whole production of speech from thought to speech. That transition can probably happen in milliseconds or seconds. 
but if you are conscious of these stages then these this theory then it will bind you it will make it will make you a better communicator let's put it that way so that is called para pashyanti madhyama vaikari these are the four stages they say in the conversion of thought to the speech so the way my pandit ji explained to me i remember it's 2012 or 13 it was uh, it was a revelation to me uh, that how they had analyzed this whole process and and you know this whole analytical method is really like so impressive uh, that how even every single process in every single intellectual activity how they have analyzed it and how they have de even debated it and and so on and so forth okay so para para means the origin of the thought okay that an idea comes into the in your brain okay in modern sense we say brain in the in the traditional way they call it inner world that is antakarna antakarna has manas chitta buddhi okay and and so on so in the manas that is in the in the mind they say an idea comes so that is in the deep mind just an idea originates in your mind then what is the use of that idea you <laughs> the idea in one brain has no value right and there is a there is a urge to communicate to share that idea communist communism communist comes from you know sharing in fact that is the origin of communication also and communism also sharing okay if you look up oxford english dictionary the etymology of communist and what what it has led to communism has come from communist also sharing and communication has also come from communist that is sharing so you are sharing a thought right just a thought in your, in one brain is i mean that person fine i mean it is a thought but it has no social significance right it's only when it gets communicated at least to one other person then it becomes uh, you can say a part of the collective consciousness part of the collective in a sense you are sharing that with somebody what is with you inside you you know it may be important to you but for others it doesn't mean anything so then the part comes of buddhi they say intellect buddhi is intellect which is has and the character of the buddhi or intellect is power of discrimination that means should i do this or should i not do this is this right is it wrong this is called power of discrimination or viveka buddhi viveka means that power of discriminating and buddhi is the one in the intellect is has that that part of the your brain or part of your consciousness does that this is according to indian theory okay so the idea originates in the brain let's say in your manas and then you have to see should i communicate this or not you know is it worth communicating should i say it or not this is a second stage the third stage they say is madhyama so para pashyanti pashyanti means seeing actually seeing means checking out should i say it or not say it okay should i do it or not do it so that is where the power of discrimination the viveka buddhi comes there viveka part of it then madhyama corresponds to now you have to verbalize it i mean how do you communicate i mean there is no telepathy right you have to communicate it which means you have to put it into language right a common language the other person should understand that language you can you know maybe it is a sign language it may be you know just some sounds some gestures but in a more advanced form or even pictures you know 
you're trying to communicate something through a picture, etc. Or signs, gestures, some sounds. But a language is a more higher development of the that means of communication. So language means words, starts with words and then starts with sentences and so on. Afterwards, the sentences, etc. So which word to use, which is the most appropriate word to use to, ex to express your thought? Now that you have decided you should express it. Your Viveka has said, yes, it is worth expressing. To so and so. Okay, to so and so. So then, which is the correct word, best word? Because if you choose the wrong word, then you are not really expressing what you have felt or what is your idea. So the choice of the word is the third stage. That you pull out from your chitta. That is deep memory. That which is the correct word. Deep memory which is also you can say a repository of language, vocabulary etc. The, the, the word vocabulary etc. Okay, so from chitta you pull out from your deep memory you pull out the correct most appropriate word to express the thought. So now that you are you have chosen the word, you have decided to express it, you have chosen the correct word, then what is in what style are you going to express it? That is called Vaikhari. Okay? And we know because we are emotional human beings, when somebody is trying to communicate something to us, we look at the style of communication. Is that person telling it to me with great empathy, with, with a selfless attitude, just he's trying to communicate something? Or is he angry with me? Is he shouting at me? Is he trying to put me down and humiliate me? Right? All this, you observe that person. How is he communicating? What is the style of communication? Why curry? So, if that person is serious about communicating his thought, he will choose the most appropriate style to communicate that thought to you. Means he also knows something about you, your psychology, your background, your history, your mood. Right now, are you in a receptive mood? Can I say something to you? If I say something to you, will you understand it or misunderstand it? Because the whole idea is to communicate, convey, not just, you know, this is what people say, na? talking to and talking at. Right? You're talking to somebody means you're actually trying to communicate. Talking at means you just bolna tha, bol diya. Usko lena hai, lene, lene do, nahi to nahi. Mujhe to kasalya gai ki maine bol diya. I've done my duty then. <laughs> okay? Or I vented my steam, my anger, my rage, my steam, whatever. So this is, I mean, this is such a wonderful way of analyzing communication. One thing. Second thing is, if we realize that these are the, this is a process, you know, these are the components of good communication, effective communication, then we, we try to adopt it consciously. Because actually, you know, this happens many times in milliseconds. Ek idea aage, aane bol diya. Dusri ko. Right? But if we are little conscious of this, should I say it? Should I not say it? How, what word should I use to say it? What style I should adopt to say it so that the other person understands what I'm trying to say, the essence of what I'm trying to say? Now, you can't say, I had very good intentions. Okay? So why is that other person looking at my style? He should look at the content of what I'm saying. That doesn't work. Most of the time, that doesn't work. Because people are subjective. People are emotional. They receive your communication also emotionally. Right? So, if there is, the, if there is a good friendship, good equation, what you say, you are on the same frequency, same page, as you say, 
that there is trust in each other that other person is not has no bad intention towards you is not trying to cut you down he is saying something which might is it might help you okay that's why he's communicating he's not just some you know motor mouth who just keeps talking and whether you know it is of any use to you or not or he is not just like trying to cut you down or trying to like you know humiliate you or etc etc right or he basically doesn't care but bol diya okay he has no concern for you right then you also don't you, you ignore it you don't care what is the content of what he is saying 99% of the time there are very few people who have that kind of stability that kind of um you can say again vivek buddhi who will say theek hai ye to matlab aise bol raha hai but the way he is saying may be very brash very abrasive you know very repelling repulsive you one you one obnoxious but there is something in what he is saying something useful something important for me so let me take that part and ignore the rest that kind of maturity very few people have number 1 number 2 even such people can lose their patience can flare up it's not that 24 by 7 all the time in their life they are like that so, so it's a different issue we are not today talking about the receiver the receiver what should be his attitude to, towards what he is getting we are talking about the communicator what are the concerns of the communicator how he should communicate if for effective communication so para pashyanti madhyama vaikhari just because a thought came don't express it think about it whether it is worth expressing whether it is worth expressing now whether it is worth expressing to this person all that okay that whole holistic thing because it may be the right thing but you are telling the wrong person or it is a wrong time that person is in no mood to accept it or even receive it or think over it later and so on okay and then comes which is a correct word to use to describe that emotion to describe that thought and you know i said many times and my firm feeling is that the biggest technology man has ever invented is not fire not anything forget about modern technology is language that when man developed language mankind developed language doesn't matter which area what language how they evolved etc but that a brain can communicate to another brain just through certain sounds of what it is feeling or what it is analyzing or what its emotions are okay because you are you are communicating complex things simplest level of communication is the way let's say to a child one year old two year old child a mother is teaching language right this is called first language acquisition how is the first language acquired that many times you point to that object so this is what you use you use the proper names that is this is door that is table this is chair etc right you hammer it like 10 times 20 times again and again and again the child registers okay this is the the sound there is no nothing else for it the sound you are producing when you say chair means what you are pointing out so that what you are pointing if you are pointing to the chair then the the sound chair corresponds to that object so this is one level where you are giving names to the objects and registering that mapping that into that other one year old child's brain right then then comes abstract abstract things i am feeling sad i'm feeling happy you know i feel like laughing i find this very comic right so these how how do you these are not objects you can point to but you have created words to convey that right so and then even more things which cannot be like even sometimes pointed out or 
they are not even abstractions like that which which you know how do you communicate sadness and happiness that other person in some ways through your body language through your gestures through your face the the child understands okay mother is happy or mother is angry okay or mother is indifferent she is not caring the child is crying he says the mother is not caring okay so how do i attract her attention and so on so this whole actually first language acquisition by a child one year old child teaches you so much about how the brains communicate how language you know is communicated the then later comes the rules of language the grammar how do you form a sentence to 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 do this so <laughs> look at that right you don't you know so called artificial intelligence supercomputers and all that we we try to like teach them language but they only follow you know you give them instructions machine language instructions and then little higher level languages basic fortran c c++ etc etc right machine languages so the machines understand your instructions they cannot understand your emotions right they take instructions right but a one year old child is much more than any supercomputer you can think of because its brain is able to understand your emotion from your gestures from your face from the way you are saying it your vaikari when mother says come here the child understands whether she is just calling come here or she is saying lovingly come here or she is angry and say come here you know so i mean i mean really the more you think about language and how you know a brain communicates to another brain it's it's simply like um mind boggling and and uh, and to think about history of language how the language originated or how man can created language i mean, nobody has any idea okay you can only guess you can uh, try to study animals and say how animals communicate and maybe this way it started and all that okay but how identification how commonality of words vocabulary got developed which is a social thing right so the whole society or a group or a community has to accept certain sounds as identifying certain objects and then even certain sounds identifying certain emotions right forget about script and writing and all that that is later <laughs> so this is so mystifying that there are philosophers like in india who thought that this was given by god why because you cannot think how it originated so things which you don't know how they originated either you say they are eternal they came from the beginning okay in the beginning was the word even bible says that so you say akshara akshara means what we say alphabet right but akshara means that which has no death which means that which is not even created because only that which you create can have death okay so i mean the whole language the evolution of language is such a fascinating thing is you can say the greatest technology mankind has ever produced that it is so mystifying its origin that you you will have to accept if somebody says oh it has always existed or it has been given by god etc etc right and in fact i think i have not studied ashtadhyayi but people who <laughs> say that in ashtadhyayi who is one of the first classical grammarians panini says that maheshwara gave this thing maheshwara created this okay? <laughs> and so on so you have to you, you i mean you don't it is it just shows the mystery of this origin of language you know how how actually the mankind developed any language okay forget about first this first that then that then this dialect and that dialect and script and all that other things those are all much much later developments <laughs> so anyway so i thought i mean this 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 break, uh, analyzing verbal communication in this manner actually gives you a uh, food for thought then next time you speak to somebody if you implement even 1% or 10% of this this prescriptions of para pasyanti madhyama vaikari then you will be a better communicator your verbal communication 
you are you have conveyed something to somebody okay effectively yeah so very nice so this this issue like the, all the time it comes like you especially if you are making you know it it is uh, this is important in any communication but especially if you are making a critical comment on somebody else's behavior somebody else's you know uh, whatever okay about somebody else to that person only then even more this is important that how do you make your criticism what words do you choose first you have to think whether it is worth expressing that criticism is worth making or not right because they can be insignificant so why raise all kinds of side issues is it a real important issue you have to decide that not just that there is an issue i mean everybody has issues millions of issues so then you'll be wasting all your time in raising those millions of issues and not really important issues so you have to see not just that there is an issue but whether it is important enough to to make that point to make that criticism then which are the, what words you have to choose what language you have to choose to express that criticism and in what style you deliver that criticism so that the other person either accepts it or is ready to think over it seriously because acceptance doesn't happen change in behavior doesn't happen acceptance means change in behavior deep acceptance not just verbally saying ha 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 ya apne sahi kaha and all correct correct i made a mistake that is not that is not acceptance acceptance means actually there is a point i have to think over it and maybe i should change my behavior right so that is the receiver part how the receiver receives criticism but how what about the critic <laughs> so i thought this is a wonderful thing now the second point uh, i think we have uh, only 10 minutes left um or 5 minutes left so i'll just mention this and we'll discuss it later the theory of debate how to conduct a debate if you have i mean this is much later you can say i mean we have earlier we talked about elementary communication between two brains now suppose you have a you have a school of thought you believe in certain things and you have developed a theory a model etc and somebody else comes with it a different theory different model different explanation of the let us say same phenomenon different point of view different world view now you try, you you think that your your theory your model your world view is correct right and other person thinks his theory his model his world view is correct so in a community in a society you can say there is a clash of these ideas now is that if if that clash should lead these different points of views different you can call it ideologies okay your world views or models or theories okay this can be a social debate it can be a scientific debate debate or you know even in a family okay different points of view on how to do some, something okay one parent has one way of dealing with children another person has another way of dealing with children and grandparents might have third fourth ways of dealing with children okay and so on right so so when there is a diversity of opinion when there is and human beings there is there are as many you can say approaches as many thoughts as many models as many theories as there are number of human beings number 1 number 2 human beings and their consciousness their behavior is also evolving so just because at certain time they had certain point of view doesn't mean that for the, from beginning to end from birth to death they will have that so they also keep changing as their experience changes as they evolve as we say right so <laughs> their their uh, uh, approach and world view also changes so but at each point in time there is a multiple ways of approaching an issue and anybody who forgets that and thinks that there is only one way of doing things and tries to impose that will totally fail doesn't matter what he is so powerful he will do it with a force of the gun or whatever the system he develops or he punishes you for having a different point of view whatever he will not be successful 
because there cannot be one point of view, one way of looking at things, one way of analyzing things, one world view, etc. ever. So then how do you conduct a civilized discussion? How do you conduct a civilized uh, way of exchange of ideas, exchange of points of views, which leads to something new? Because such a clash can lead to refinement of both, further development of both. Okay, And this is how, in fact, the word dialectics comes from that dialogue, dialogos. In the Greek Socratic tradition, that is, Socrates and his uh, students and all that, he used to encourage, he also used to do that. Like, he's giving a point of view, somebody else gives a point of view, and then, you know, each one elaborates that and, and so on. So, each one, like, because the other person is questioning you, so you'll have to, like, elaborate it further, refine it further. In the process, you'll also change. That other person can also change, and so on. Of course, I mean, science and whether it is social science, natural science says that just through dialogue, truth will not emerge, right? It is not just a clash of ideas. Finally, there has to be a test, test in reality, right? There is a, there has to be an observable effect. If you have two different points of views, if you are describing the same thing in two different ways, it's fine. Okay, it can be so. But if you are saying this will lead to that, or, you know, you're making a prediction, then that prediction has to be tested. And that, that observation finally will decide like whose approach was better or more, you know, realistic than the uh, the other's approach, etc. So, there is a way of deciding something, which is observation. And of course, how do you observe, with what accuracy you observe, and since uh, uh, the phenomenon is also changing, today you might observe it and say, this come to this conclusion. And tomorrow, like the things might change and then you observe it and then you might come to a different conclusion. That also happens, right? Nothing, none of this is static. The world is not static. Human beings are not static. Words of views are not static. So, um, uh, so the in the Indian tradition, and this, how to argue, how to debate, how there should be civilized discussion. On this, there is a great amount of thought. This is the theory of argumentation. Okay. And the people who wrote extensively about it were interestingly two scientists. One was a surgeon and other was a medical man. One was Charaka, other is Sushwata. And particularly Charaka's writing is very famous. Okay. He, he compiled the first Materia Medica, what is called Materia Medica, identifying each herb, its properties, different parts of the herb. The flower has this characteristic, the root has this characteristic, the stem has this characteristic, the leaf has this characteristic. And if you make this out of it, the potion out of it, you you boil it and you make a potion out of it, you know, decoction out of it, or you make a, you uh, crush it and you make a layer out of it, you know, put, add some, all that, right? The Ayurvedic, the, he's called the father of Ayurveda, why? Not because he just invented Ayurveda. What is now accepted is he systematized the existing medical knowledge from as many sources as possible. So he didn't create Ayurveda. Obviously, people developed Ayurveda. Right? Just like we say music, classical music came out of folk music. So like that, from folk traditional traditions of various communities, depending on where they were living, somebody may be living in Himalayas, somebody may be living in the Northeast, you know, somebody may be living in Sayadri, somebody may be living in the plains, so, okay, and so on, depending on what herbs they were available, what animals they were, uh, were available, what other minerals were available, they like discovered over a period of time, maybe hundreds and thousands of years, what works where, right? So these were, you can say, traditional way of treating things, treating illnesses or treating conditions, right? In, if you look at the medical science of it, medical part of it. So, and prescriptions, ye karo, ye mat karo, ye khao, wo mat khao, I say jivo, ye karo, wo mat karo. So that you will not become, you will be nirogi. You will be like, you will not, roga will not affect you or if you have a roga, then maybe if you do this, 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 this is this, this way of life, lifestyle, as well as ingestion of this, 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 this kind of medicine, then it can lead to positive effect. So, <laughs> maybe thousands of years this thing developed and this has happened in every civilization and every region. So, that's why we talk about Tibetan system and the Chinese system and, and so on and so forth in every system you had all these types of things, right? In every region of the world, 
so in india which it, since india itself is like a continent and different parts of india uh, will have different herbs different things so all these people whatever had developed charaka you, is credited with systematizing them putting a theoretical framework and listing out like iska ye hota hai iska ye hota hai okay Uh, because even people say that you know he he uh, he has written about herbs which were not available to him because charaka is supposed to have lived in kashi okay so he, 